The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Joining Forces in Hepatocellular Carcinoma, Enhancing Multidisciplinary Care in an Era of New Therapeutic Solutions. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash GWD860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today. Um, I'm honored to be part of an excellent panel here with uh, Dr. Lovett, Dr. Zhu, Dr. Um, uh, Kulik here. Um, I think that we have an exciting program where we're going to really be talking about several different aspects of HCC and the progress we've made over the last several years. And so we're really going to jump right in and we're going to talk about um, first-line selection, treatment sequencing, and the important role of the hepatologist um, as we make treatment decisions for HCC. So first, just to review some basic um, data in terms of HCC epidemiology, it's important to remember that actually when you take a look at HCC incidence, this is one of the um, cancers that's rising in terms of incidence in the United States. And when you take a look at this, this is rising in most subgroups, um, whether this is divided by males, females, or whether this is divided by racial ethnic groups. When you take a look at racial ethnic groups, this is increasing in Hispanics, blacks, whites. The one that we have made um, some uh, projected progress is in Asian patients, and this is really driven by um, increasing hepatitis B prevention and treatment in this uh, subgroup of patients. And in parallel with this rising incidence, the more notable thing is that we actually are seeing a rise in mortality. So when you take a look at the top 15 causes of cancer death over the last 15 years, you can see that we've actually made progress in terms of most common cancers here, lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, you see decreases in terms of mortality. This is related to improvements in early detection as well as some of our treatment modalities. However, over that same time period, you can see increases in terms of pancreas and brain cancer, but by far leading the way is an increase in mortality for liver cancer. And so this really highlights the need for better early detection as well as better treatments. As many of you are aware, this is really a disease within a disease. So this is two conditions that most patients have. And over 90% of patients in the Western world, we see HCC in the setting of severe chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. And we know that this, um, that this chronic liver disease can happen from multiple e etiologies, whether this is viral hepatitis, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, or non-viral etiologies, including alcohol-associated liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Once patients progress to cirrhosis, they have about a 2 to 3% annual risk of developing HCC. And as many of you know, we've seen a shift in terms of the epidemiology of the underlying etiology. So we've seen basically as more direct acting antivirals have come to market, we've seen a decrease in terms of hepatitis C related HCC. But over that same time period, we've seen a dramatic rise of NASH-related HCC. And that's not only here in the United States, but this is really something that is um, seen worldwide. This is a slide that many of you have seen several times. This is the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Staging System. And I think that this really gives us a framework in terms of how to at least start making treatment decisions for HCC. And I think one of the key things to point out here on this slide is that if you're found at an early stage, we continue to have curative therapies available with local ablation, surgical resection, and liver transplantation. And these patients can achieve five-year survival rates exceeding um, 60 to 70 percent. And so it's important that if you find patients at an early stage, that you really refer for these treatment considerations. Now, if you're found to have liver localized disease, but it's beyond an early stage, then really the standard has really been local regional therapy, whether that's chemoembolization, more data coming out for radioembolization, there's been increasing use of stereotactic body radiation therapy in some of these patients, but really local regional therapy, and we've seen that the median survival for these patients is somewhere on the order of two to three years. However, the focus of today's program is really going to be the BCLC stage C patients, those patients who have portal vein invasion, extrahepatic spread, but with preserved liver function, 
And the, the, the standard for these patients has really been systemic therapy. And as many of you may remember, um, you know, for many years, we only had one treatment options, but there's really been an explosion um, in the last couple years. And that's really gonna be the focus of our program is the explosion of therapeutic options in this space, both in the first line, second line setting, as well as some of the new therapeutics that we expect to come in. Now, of course, when we start talking about advanced cancer, you know, it begs the questions, you know, how do hepatologists fit into the management of HCC? And of course, I'm biased as a hepatologist, but I think that really hepatologists play a central role in the management of HCC. Not only do we typically perform surveillance, key and early detection, educating patients about their liver disease, but really these patients are our patients, so they were the gatekeepers in terms of, um, you know, identifying and finding the HCC in these patients. And I think it's important not just to hand off those patients at that point, but instead continue to work with you know, medical oncologists, interventional radiologists, surgeons, et cetera, continue to work with that multidisciplinary team to develop a personalized treatment plan that can really optimize um, survival. So we're gonna start with a case. The case is a 57-year-old man, hepatitis C-related cirrhosis, child pu A. Here you can see his labs. The patient has no ascites, no encephalopathy, has a mildly elevated um, AFP of 74, good performance status, and is actually actively working as a dental hygienist. Uh, he has uh, an MRI that actually shows multifocal HCC. Uh, the, the HCC has arterial enhancement, delayed washout, is consistent with HCC, but the patient also has right portal vein tumor thrombus. And so when you, t when you think of um, uh, treatment options approaching this patient, really this patient strictly falls into the BCLC stage C uh, category. And the two treatment options that are recommended, both in terms of ASLD and easel guidelines, for this patient um, really is serafinib or lenvatinib. And when you take a look at the level of evidence, both of these are supported by large phase three randomized studies and therefore have a strong recommendation to be considered um, as a, a treatment option in patients with advanced HCC. And as we'll talk about, unfortunately, there are currently no clinical or molecular biomarkers that are established in terms of actually choosing between these two agents, but we will talk about some of the other clinical factors that can aid you in your decision making. So first, just to review the SHARP trial, this is um, a study that's been around for the last 10 years, actually published uh, by my colleague here, Dr. Lovett, in the New England Journal, 2008. This was a, um, a study that took six, over 600 patients with advanced HEC, macroscopic vascular invasion, and or extrahepatic spread. And it randomized patients um, to either serafinib at its typical dose of 400 milligrams twice daily, or placebo. Once again, this is a slide that you probably have seen several times, but in short, this, this was the first randomized control trial that actually showed an improvement in survival in patients with advanced HCC. Uh, median survival in the placebo group, 7.9 months versus 10.7 months for the serafinib group. And there you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves and the hazard ratio of 0.69, so a 31% reduction in overall mortality. Now, of course, the um, SHARP trial, it included patients with advanced HCC, but these patients all had good liver function, so they were all child PUA. Because um, serafinib has been around for the past decade, we actually have the benefit of having real-world effectiveness data. So here you can see data from the Gideon study that evaluated this in um, real-world effectiveness, so clinical settings, and you can see that um, serafinib was not only used in child PUA patients, but has been used in child PUB patients. And so here you can see that actually when you take a look at the AEs and child PUA and child PUB patients, they're actually very similar. And so the, the conclusion of this is that serafinib appears well tolerated across patient subgroups and in extended populations, including selected patients with child PUB cirrhosis. Now, when, I remember when, this, uh, when the SHARP trial came out, I think everyone said this is good, this is a first step, and we expected to have many more agents over the next couple years. But instead, over the next decade, all we had was disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, multiple failed trials, and instead, we had nothing else besides serafinib. And so serafinib remained king of the hill for a long period of time. But once again, alluding to the fact that we've had several trials that have come through, the REFLECT trial is actually the next positive trial in the first line setting. And so to briefly go over this, um, the design of the REFLECT trial, because I think this is slightly different than the SHARP trial, 
First, this is a randomized study that was defined as a non-inferiority study. And what this means is that actually um, the, the investigators here actually enrolled more patients. This is notably a much larger study, so nearly 950 patients compared to the other trials that you'll hear about that actually are much closer to 500 and 600 patients. This allows you to achieve a tighter confidence interval and actually allows you to establish non-inferiority where the upper confidence interval falls within a pre-specified range. So this is an important point to consider when interpreting the results of the REFLECT study. Um, the study otherwise did take patients with advanced HCC, um, but once again, good liver function, so child PUA. Of note, the REFLECT trial did exclude patients who had greater than 50% liver involvement, excluded patients with bile duct invasion, um, or extensive main portal vein invasion. Patients were randomized to receive lumvatinib at its um, typical weight-based dosing. So um, if it was eight milligrams if you weigh less than 60 kilograms, or it was 12 milligrams if your weight exceeded 60 kilograms. Um, and then the other group was randomized to receive serafinib, once again, at its typical dose of 400 milligrams twice daily. Primary endpoint of this trial was overall survival. And here you can see, once again, the main results, the primary outcome of the study. And essentially, lumvatinib was uh, non-inferior to serafinib. So you can see that the hazard ratio there, 0.92, um, with a 95% confidence interval extending up to 1.06. And that's why I think it's important to remember that this was designed as a non-inferiority study. So even though the confidence interval passed one, it's okay because the 95% confidence interval was below 1.08 i.e. the pre-specified outcome to establish non-inferiority. You can see that the median survival in lumvatinib group was 13.6 months versus 12.3 months for serafinib. Now, even though the two um, uh, agents have similar survival, there were, secondary, there were se several secondary endpoints that were pre-specified that I think are very interesting. The first is progression-free survival, and here you can see that lumvatinib um, doubled progression-free survival compared to serafinib. So uh, median progression-free survival in the lambatinib bar was 7.4 months versus 3.7 for the serafinib with a hazard ratio of 0.66. And even more notable is the response rates that you can see with lambatinib. And so you can see here whether you do this by M-resist, i.e. the degree, like the amount of arterial enhancement, or by resist, i.e. the size of the actual tumor, uh, whether this is a cavity or arterial enhancing, you can see that the responses with lumvatinib are, are, are much higher uh, with lumvatinib than with serafinib. So by m resist you see actually responses in the lumvatinib arm that exceed 40% compared to 12% for serafinib. And likewise with the resist 1.1, you can see that the responses with lumvatinib are just short of 20%, right at 18.8 compared to 6.5 for serafinib. So three times higher in the lumvatinib arm, no matter how, which um, uh, uh, response assessment you used. Now, when you take a look at the adverse event profile, I think it's important to remember that the AE profile for both of these medications, both these medications are TK, TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and so they actually have the same possible adverse events. The most common you can see highlighted here in red boxes, hypertension, decreased appetite, decreased weight, uh, hand-foot skin reaction, and proteinuria. But the thing that's worth noting is that the proportion of patients who experience any of these AEs does differ between the two groups. And so what you can see here is that actually the hypertension is significantly higher with lumvatinib than it is with serafinib. You can see that the constitutional symptoms of having decreased appetite, decreased weight, also more notable with the lumvatinib than serafinib. You can see proteinuria with lumvatinib um, that typically is um, uh, rarely seen with serafinib. However, you see significantly lower rates of hand-foot skin reaction with lumvatinib as compared to serafinib. Other AEs, such as diarrhea and fatigue, are pretty similar between the two agents. So overall, how do we do this? I, I started by saying that we unfortunately don't have any great biomarkers that help us you know, really decide between the two agents. So it's not like you can simply check a blood test or you know, anything on the biopsy that would really drive you to choose serafinib versus lumvatinib. But instead, we we're forced to use some of the clinical differences in trial design, as well as some of the differences in terms of um, you know, efficacy and AE profile. And here what I've highlighted in red, um, at least in my opinion, are some of the 
differences uh, that can help you make decisions. So first, in terms of inclusion criteria, I did discuss that the REFLECT trial excluded patients with greater than 50% liver involvement, main portal vein, tumor thrombus, and bile duct invasion. So you can argue that you have less data for lenvatinib in these patient subgroups. Now, it's important to note that an absence of data doesn't mean an absence of efficacy. By no stretch am I saying that lenvatinib doesn't work in these patients. It just means that we currently have less data in those patients. Next, you can see in terms of efficacy, we talked about that these agents really give you um, similar survival. I think all of us would agree that this is by far the most important outcome for both providers and patients. However, in terms of secondary outcomes, you did see um, substantially higher response rates um, with lamatinib than serafinib. And then I just reviewed the differences in terms of AE profile, and you can see a summary here on this slide. But I think that these differences in AE profile can help decide between these two agents in selected patients. Both of these are given orally. They're taken daily. But there is some subtle differences in terms of logistics in the sense that serafinib has to be removed from food, whereas lenvatinib can be taken with or without food. So some of these minor differences can help in terms of patient ease and maybe patient adherence. And finally, I talked about the Gideon data giving us uh, real-world effectiveness data, particularly in extended patient populations, including child PUB cirrhosis. And so personally, I would feel more comfortable in terms of currently using serafinib and a child PUB patient um, while awaiting more data for, 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 for lenvatinib in, in uh, patients with, uh, with worse liver function. So going back to our, our patient, our 57-year-old male with hep C cirrhosis, uh, once again, you'll remember that he's child PUA, he has good performance status, he's actively working. And when we think of what would be a appropriate treatment options for this patient, um, I think that um, you really, once again, are left with these two agents in terms of levatinib and serafinib. And I, I think maybe, once again, I'm not saying there's a right answer here. I think that you could say that you have some concern about hand-foot skin reaction, um, since he's actively working as a dental hygienist, works, uses his hands on a regular basis. And so you may be more likely to use um, lymvatinib in this patient population, or in this specific patient. So um, even more exciting um, in, in terms of the advances that we've seen in the frontline setting, I think the, the, the great thing that you're going to hear about over the next section is really uh, that we've had an explosion of options in the second line setting. And so um, without stealing uh, Dr. Lovett's thunder, I'm, I'm just going to say that we've seen several agents. You can see them listed here, regorafenib, cabozantinib, ramaciramab, as well as the checkpoint inhibitors. And so you're going to hear data in terms of all of these potential agents that can be used. But I I do think that overall, having these multiple lines of therapy does highlight the importance of transitioning, following these patients on therapy and transitioning at the appropriate time. Now, we've had a lot of things that have been answered in terms of HEC management, and we've had a lot of advances. But I think in the setting of advances, then there's a lot of questions in terms of how do we actually implement this in our clinical practice. So as I said, it's important to transition at the right time. But of course, the question is, what is that right time? But I think that we all can agree that we do have to transition from low regional therapy to systemic therapy to give these new agents um, a, a potential to actually improve patient outcomes. Of course, the next thing that you're going to hear about is how do we actually sequence these patients? Like, what is the appropriate first line? What's the appropriate second line agent? What gives you the best outcomes? And I think, once again, this is a quickly evolving field. And I think that there's um, a lot more questions right now than there are answers. Questions of patient selection, a need for biomarkers to actually um, be more intelligent in terms of how we select between um, different treatment options. Local plus systemic therapy is really an exciting area as well that has a lot of investigation um, and a frontier that uh, really needs uh, further investigation. So I think there's a few moments to answer a couple uh, questions from uh, the audience uh, and then we'll move to the second uh, talk. So one of the first questions we see, what is the reason for the discrepancy between overall survival and progression-free survival in the REFLECT trial? So I'll tell you, you know, this has been um, somewhat of an enigma in terms of, you know, the, you would think that if you see significant, um, you know, there should be a tight association between response and progression-free survival um, with overall survival. But when you take a look, if we even go back historically and you take a look at serafinib, serafinib was able to prolong um, survival with actually, without actually inducing responses. 
And so there's clearly a lot to be learned in terms of the, so this link between progression-free survival and how well it links to overall survival. So, Joseph, you recently had a paper that actually yeah. looked at this association has now established a cutoff that may be able to better link progression-free survival and overall survival. I'll yeah. let you briefly remark on that, on that very, paper very as well. Very shortly. So I would say that um, progression-free survival is um, uh, hits first let's say, so the trials in which you have overall survival positive, always you have progression-free survival positive, but doesn't happen the other way around. So you have several trials. We analyzed 21 trials in front line and second line. And um, out of those, seven have positive progression-free survival, but only four have overall survival. And then when we check the hazard ratio, so the potency in the different in progression-free survival, the hazard ratio below 0 0.6 was indicating always benefit in survival. Whereas patients, for instance, in the case of the reflector IL, that the hazard ratio is 0 0.66, in fact, there are no differences in overall survival. The hazard ratio is 0 0.92. So then we were recommending that, and uh, at least in the trials that have been published after that, this, uh, this threshold is, 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 is uh, actually being confirmed in these trials. So you need a huge progression-free survival in order to hit overall survival. It's not enough to have a positive difference in progression-free. Yeah. And I'll just do one more question. Yeah. So in a patient with HCC, positive hepatitis C RNA, will you initiate anti-hepatitis C uh, treatment together with a checkpoint inhibitor? I think it's an interesting question. Um, you know, we're finding more and more patients that actually do benefit from hepatitis C therapy. Um, I think the patients with intermediate and advanced active HCC, I think that we do need better data in terms of showing if there's um, any benefit to doing this, particularly as the median survival for this patient population continues to improve with advances. And so this is um, an area where we're starting to see some data come out. There are ongoing studies which I think will help better um, evaluate this question. The data that are available show that patients who have achieved SVR and then are treated with the, these agents subsequently, it doesn't mean actively treating them right now with advanced HEC, um, but um, those patients tend to do better than patients with active viremia. I do think that the other um, part of this question may have been, do we need to suppress the hepatitis C, just like we would for like hepatitis B? But there is actually no need to do this from a risk of like flare, per se. Like, that's not a safety concern of having active iremia while treating uh, with the checkpoint inhibitors. I think you may hear a little bit more about the safety of, of the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, um, you know, uh, when those data are presented, including in people with hepatitis C. So for this, for the second part of the, uh, for the second lecture, we're going to hear from Dr. Lovett, um, who, among many um, different titles, um, is the director of the Mount Sinai Liver Cancer Program, um, and the director of uh, a Master in Translational Medicine um, at Mount Sinai um, and Barcelona, respectively. He's going to be talking about uh, second-line uh, targeted therapy options for HCC. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Well. Let's start with the case and then we'll move to the actual content, right? This is a 65-year-old woman with chronic hepatitis B on entecavir with undetectable viral load, childbook A-class, platelet 252, ECOG 0, identified with a new elevation of AFP to 65 nanograms milliliter, and the MRI showing 13 centimeters uh, right uh, tumor loaf, uh, LIRATS 5, to mean confirming HCC with two satellite lesions, no evidence of vascular invasion or, extra, or extrapathic spread. She was treated with uh, Y90 and achieved uh, necrosis, but there was a new tumor thrombus in the main portal vein and multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules. And then she started on uh, sorafenib, uh, 400 twice daily and develop hand-foot skin reaction at the grade three. So this means that he, she had to discontinue the drug, then FP uh, move up to 278. Still, the ECOF performance status was a zero for her. So as uh, Amit has mentioned, we have frontline sorafenib lembatinib. In this case, so we're talking about someone that is 
not tolerating sorafenib, and uh, certainly with uh, some uh, progression there. And we have in second line, regorafenib, cabozantinib, and ramucirumab, that these three treatments have been shown to show survival differences compared to placebo. And then we have two treatments, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, that uh, Dr. Su will address that were approved by FDA based on phase two data. So according to the ESL and uh, ASLD guidelines, regorafenib is recommended a second line treatment for patients that tolerate sorafenib, and this is important, this concept. So there are 15% of the patients in front line that do not tolerate sorafenib and therefore cannot receive regorafenib in second line and uh, have a well-preserved liver function, chap okay, and good performance status, zero or one. There is high level of evidence, I will show you now, and is are strongly recommended. Then cabozantinib and ramucirumab have shown survival benefits versus placebo in this setting, and the evidence, again, is high based on uh, randomized controlled trials. Recommendations for the guidelines is strong. And then there are uh, two treatments, uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, that in uncontrolled uh, data, phase two data, show a potential benefit, then the evidence is moderate and the recommendation according to guidelines is weak, but that phase three trials have come after these guidelines were released and you will see the data. So let's talk first about the evidence behind regorafenib. Uh, as you can see in the inclusion criteria, uh, HCC should be documented with radiological progression during sorafenib treatment. And on top of it, of course, the patient uh, needs to be tolerant to sorafenib. Then the patients were randomized to do one to receive regorafenib per placebo, and primary endpoint was overall survival, and secondary endpoints were the usual progression-free time to progression response rate, and so on. So this is the main slide uh, summarizing the results of the trial. 10.6 month median survival for regorafenib, 7.8 months for placebo, and a hazard ratio of 0.63, so the drug is able to decrease the risk of death in 37%, and I have to say it was surprising to see this strong effect considering that regorafenib in reality uh, has a, a, st a structure and is targeting more or less the same uh, uh, drivers than sorafenib. Uh, here you have the subgroup analysis, regorafenib benefits uh, almost all subgroup of patients compared to placebo, uh, including uh, uh, patients with high AFP, and also, interestingly enough, patients with hepatitis B and patients with hepatitis C less so compared to sorafenib. In terms of uh, treatment immersion, adverse events, uh, the classical ones that were expected that are known in colorectal cancer for regorafenib, and similar to those that uh, uh, happened with uh, sorafenib, hand food skin reaction, 13% grade three, and then hypertension also 13%, norexia 3% compared to placebo. And this was an interesting approach, also we need to be cautious here. Uh, so the authors uh, took the patients randomized to sorafenib versus placebo and went back uh, calculating which is the median survival from the time that the patient received sorafenib for the first time. So in, in, the, uh, in the line of 26 month median survival, this represents sorafenib followed by regorafenib where the orange line of 19.2 represents sorafenib followed by placebo. This also indicates that we are analyzing a subgroup of patients. So out of 100% of the patients receiving frontline sorafenib, only 40% are able to receive second-line therapies between 40 and 50%. And here you have the selection. Plus placebo, you have 19.2 month median survival. So let's talk about celestial trial, cabozantinib versus placebo. Uh, after sorafenib. So the, the, the inclusion criteria were the classical ones, advanced HCC, childbook A-class, ECOG-01, prior sorafenib, or progression uh, on up to uh, two prior uh, uh, therapies. So the patients were randomized to cabozantinib, that is a drug, is a multikinase inhibitor 
that is blocking VHAF, lateral drive, the classical ones, even type 2, but also it's blocking MET signaling. And in HCC, there are only 3% mutations or amplifications of MET, but 50% of the patients in front line and 60% of the patients in second line have activation of MET. And this is uh, the important, right? So primary endpoint was overall survival, secondary endpoints, progression-free, and objective response and rate. So here you have the results of the trial, 10.2 months median survival, and placebo is always around eight months. Uh, in, in second line. The hazard ratio was 0 0.76 with a p-value of 0 0.005. So therefore, this drug was approved for use in patients with a bad HCC previously treated with sorafenib as per January 2019. Also, when exploring secondary endpoints, here again, so with this message of progression-free survival, look at the hazard ratio was 0 0.44, certainly far far below the 0.6 that we think that is the threshold to indicate uh, overall survival benefits. And in the subgroup analysis, I would highlight first that patients with extrapathic spread or macrovascular invasion uh, seem to benefit uh, more from cabozantinib, has a ratio 0.73, and also patients with hepatitis B virus has a ratio 0.69. In terms of adverse events, grade 3, 4, here uh, we are showing that hand food skin reaction also is very prevalent with cabozantinib, 17%, hypertension, 16%, increased ST, 12%, fatigue, 10 and diarrhea, 10%. And there were grade 5 treatment-related uh, adverse events, six cases with cabozantinib as a result of all these circumstances. So the question is, what are her treatment options. So we have regorafenib, we have cabozantinib, we have ramucirumab. Regorafenib, the patient did not tolerate sorafenib in frontline. You remember that the patient developed hot food skin reaction grade three. And with ramucirumab, I haven't shown the data yet, so we have that uh, it's only indicated with patients uh, with aggressive tumors defined as FP more than 400, so in this case, it seems that cabozantinib will be the treatment of choice. We have a case here. This is a 62-year-old man with hepatitis C virus, cirrhosis, and also metabolic syndrome with diabetes, uh, complicated with uh, nephropathy and hypertension, CHAPUK A. FP 152, ECOF performance status zero. MRI show uh, three lesions, the largest with six centimeters, and hepatic vein thrombus. So with a patient with hepatic vein thrombus, I will not treat the patient with, with taste, but nonetheless, patient was treated with taste, and then developed disease progression, including adrenal metastasis, for instance, and other types of metastasis. It started on sorafenib, 400 milligrams, twice daily, and, and then had stable disease and FP declined to 120, and then developed rising FP again and progression in adrenal, nodal, and rib metastasis with an FP of 948 and ECOF performance. So it's a patient that somehow tolerated well sorafenib, but certainly the disease progressed on sorafenib. So again, so we have these options, as I mentioned before, and I already talked about the resource trial, regorafenib, the evidence behind that. So already talk about cabozantinib. Let's talk a bit about ramucirumab. So ramucirumab, I would say, is the only drug that we have approved that in reality is doing somehow, it's, it's really precision medicine in a sense that is blocking only uh, one uh, kinase, so, uh, uh, sorry, one receptor, BHR receptor 2. And all the other drugs are multi-kinase inhibitors, sorafenib, regorafenib, are blocking around 40 kinases, the same lembatinib and cabos, cabozantinib. So ramucirumab is a monoclonal antibody against one receptor. And this receptor is so important in the biology 
of, of HCC that leads to survival difference just by blocking one receptor. Well, so first we had the REACH trial comparing for all comers ramucirumab versus placebo. The trial was negative, but uh, the subgroup analysis in patients with FP more than 400 already show uh, substantial benefits, 7.8 months versus 4.2 months, and has a ratio of 0.67. Well, this is a very strong signal of efficacy, of course, this hypothesis generating. And then the second trial just enriched for patients with FP more than 400. And here you have the, the outcome of these patients, 8.5 versus 7.3 with a hazard ratio of 0 0.72 and a p-value of 0 0.01. So then here I'm showing the meta-analysis of the two studies the subgroup analysis of FP more than 400 of REACH and the whole trial of REACH2 that, in my view, reflects better the population with FP more than 400. And as you can see here, ramucirumab, 8.1 months, placebo 5. Look, in second line, we have the outcome of placebo is around 8 months, but in patients with FP more than 400, it's 5 months median survival. And as a ratio was 0.69. So uh, then there is a subgroup analysis regarding sorafenib tolerant and sorafenib progressors, and you can see the hazard ratio is uh, uh, significant in, in these cases. Then in terms of adverse events, I think that the drug uh, uh, is less toxic than the TKIs. You have hypertension as expected, 12.7% uh, of the cases grade three, and encephalopathy, despite that we're only talking about childhood eight patients. So the natural history of childhood A is not expecting encephalopathy in the first two years. And nonetheless, here you have grade three in 3% of the patients, probably as a result of shunting. So then, in the case we were talking about, right, so, uh, well, so it was a patient that tolerate Sorafenib and progressive sorafenib. Can we give Rego? Well, Rego, we can give it because uh, the patient tolerates sorafenib and then upon progression, in, so we know that improved survival, similar adverse events. The patient had grade one, two uh, hand food, and here you have the administration dose. Here you have cabozantinib. Can we give cabozantinib? Yep, well, so the patient is intolerant and progress. Uh, and then an, an improved survival, similar uh, AEs as uh, Rego is, is difficult in this case to decide between one and the other uh, as based on AEs. And certainly the patient had an FP above 900, so then the patient could be considered for ramucirumab. We know that improved survival, and we know that is very well tolerated uh, compared to uh, uh, regorafenib and cabozantinib. Nonetheless, you need IV infusion every two weeks. Joseph, I, I have um, one question myself. Is so you know the the fa the, the second line trials have yes. all been conducted after serafinib because yes. that was the standard of care yeah. um, when these trials were designed. But you know now, as we just discussed, we have um, a couple first line options. So um, I guess. Can we use these after lenvatinib? This is, there is on one side an academic discussion, okay, well, uh, cabozantinib has not been shown to be effective after lemba, for instance, right? Or, or rego or uh, ramo. But this is really an academic discussion because now, and, and, and Andrew will talk about that, we have a tesobeba that hit uh, survival superiority compared to sorafenib in frontline. So then probably this will become the standard of care in frontline. This means that we cannot use sorafenib or lembatinib because then it has not been proven. These trials are not going to be conducted anymore, right? So I think that we need to adapt to the reality. And the reality is, OK, when you have a frontline uh, coming, so the others automatically will become second line. And I think that we're talking about second line. These drugs will be, in reality, third line as we speak. So yeah. I think that we can use those drugs. And then, um, you know, one of the other, the, um, one of the other questions came out in terms of AE management. The question specifically focuses on hypertension, um, but if you can also just discuss, you know, typical like AE management. If you have just high level well, discussions and yeah. specifically with the hypertension, do you well, do anything different between hypertension with the TKIs versus gramucirumab? Uh, 
the management uh, with hypertension generally with one drug, the majority of patients that are not baseline, uh, um, uh, that, that don't have hypertension, you can manage them with uh, uh, the regular drugs. And sometimes in, in grade three, four, eventually you require, you require a, a couple of drugs. And certainly you have to take into account uh, for the other management, the most controversial and difficult to manage, I would say, would be hand food skin reaction, grade three, that certainly you have to stop the, the drug. Sometimes it is recommended to reinitiate the drug in front line with sorafenib. When, when we only had sorafenib, we have to manage everything around sorafenib, so then withdraw the drug. Note that it has been shown that hand food skin reaction is associated with uh, better uh, outcome. So it, it, it indicates activity and at the same time is an adverse event. So you have to balance that. So uh, with grade three, it recommended to withdraw. Uh, formerly, we were reintroducing always sorafenib. Now, since you have the chance to uh, uh, have Another drug in frontline, I have to say, and this is a misconception in my view. So if the patient does not tolerate, in my mind, sorafenib in frontline mm -hmm. in the first month, in reality, you cannot consider that the patient is a, 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 is a second line patient because has not been properly exposed to frontline. So I would recommend to use lenvatinib in this patient. Of course, if, if we're talking about three or four months, on sorafenib, then it's a, it's a second line thing, right? But if, if this occurs, and sometimes this occurs the first month, I will, I will use mm, lembatinib without a problem. And then, so in these cases of grade three, certainly you cannot use regorafenib in second line. Uh, short, very quickly, with regard to the hypertension yep. used by levantinib or remdesivirmab, I actually follow the similar scheme in managing these patients. I think my top choice is calcium channel blocker, yeah. but essentially all the hypertensive medications will actually but suffice. only one drug or sometimes? Well, it depends on the severity, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Joseph, that was, that was great. Um, really exciting time, obviously, in the second line setting. And as you said, with some of the advances that we're gonna hear about soon with the Tizobev, the question is, do these um, potentially move into the third line? Um, so the next uh, talk that we're gonna be hearing about is uh, from Dr. Zhu. Um, who is Director Emeritus of the Liver Cancer Research Program um, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. He's gonna be talking to us about checkpoint inhibitors, emerging strategies on combinations and new modalities. Thank you, Andrew, go ahead. Thank you, Amey. Uh, as the only medical oncologist on the podium, <laughs> uh, I feel the privilege of sharing some of the development in the checkpoint inhibitor field. Uh, let's start with the case. This is actually a 65-year man with hepatitis C and was treated uh, with direct acting antiviral therapy two years ago. He presented to his primary uh, medical office with right upper quadrant pain and was found to have eight centimeter mass with satellite lesions in the right lobe. And the lesion was actually hypervascular with delayed washout. Uh, he, the tumor was also showing portal invasion. Laboratory value was notable for playlist count of 95 bilirubin 1.2, uh, the rest of the labs was actually fairly unremarkable. His tumor marker AFP was at 78 nanogram per ml. And on exam, no ascites, no encephalopathy, and ECOP performance status one. So his staging definitely did not show any evidence of extrahepatic disease, uh, but due to the presence of vascular invasion, he was classified as BCLC stage C, and he was rightfully started with sorafenib at four dose, 400 milligram twice daily. He did go through dose reduction after three weeks, mainly due to fatigue, weight loss, anorexia. And he was able to continue the treatment for four months, but then eventually showed evidence of disease progression. And he's showing evidence of disease in the left lobe, as well as increased size of the mass in the right lobe and the extension of portal vein invasion. So I guess the question is really what to do if you see a patient in this scenario. So we all know that the treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma is evolving very rapidly. Uh, you just heard you know, from Dr. Lavey about the development of, of target therapy. 
But having said that, you know, the checkpoint inhibitor or immunotherapy development in this disease is definitely catching a lot of excitement. And right in 2019, uh, we actually have two FDA-approved agents in the second-line setting, nivolumab, in the setting of underlying child PUA, OB7, and another agent, pembrolizumab, uh, in the setting of underlying child PUA. And I will review the data in a minute. But as you can see, uh, these are not the only two drugs. Uh, we actually have additional clinical investigation looking at the combination of this class of agents, uh, either with other checkpoint inhibitors or actually with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors or antiangiogenics. We also have other PD-1 uh, antibodies, like tizolizumab is another PD-1 antibody being investigated in the first line as monotherapy. Camarilizumab, another PD-1 antibody, is being investigated in, in the context of combined with a patinib, another TKI, with VEGFR2 inhibition. And then we have two PD-L1 antibodies, dervulumab and atezolizumab. And these two drugs are also investigated in the first-line setting for dervulumab. It's actually tested in combination with tremolizumab, a CTLA-4 antibody. And with the tizolizumab being investigated both in the setting of combined with cabozantinib as well as with bevcizumab. Now let's start by reviewing the clinical experience of nivolumab. Uh, I think the most extensive experience came from this well-conducted study uh, of nivolumab. And in this particular study, a uh, patient uh, with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, not amenable to cur curative intent treatment, but it has to have underlying child PUA or B7, and patient receiving nivolumab and in different cohorts. The first cohort undergoing dose escalation and then dose expansion and with different underlying etiology. And then the study was expanded to additional cohort, for example, randomized phase two study looking at the relevant efficacy of nivolumab versus sorafenib, nivolumab in child PUB subpopulation, and combination of nivolumab with ipilimumab, a CTLA-4 antibody, and also combination treatment of double checkpoint inhibitor plus cabozantinib. So this is a very ambitious trial that actually led to a lot of very, very useful clinical information. The first thing is really the clinical efficacy of nivolumab in different subgroups. Shown on this slide is that Patient uh, with uninfected cohort sorafen naive population or uninfected cohort sorafen progressor, either, or either uh, with underlying HCV or underlying hepatitis B infection, you can appreciate that nivolumab produce a radiological responses between 14% up to 23%. So the response rate actually was very, very consistent uh, in each subgroup. And in the final total cohort, uh, the response rate was actually 14.3% uh, if you look at those uh, who failed sorafenib. And for that reason, uh, the FDA actually gave the accelerator approval in this agent, for this agent, and also the packaging insert uh, quoted 14.3% as the expected response rate. If you look at the adverse events, I think you know, when this agent was first examined in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, one of the concerns is actually patients with underlying viral etiology. So there was actually a concern whether this class of agent were actually having the viral flare in this patient population. So the investigators actually proceeded very logically uh, from patients without underlying viral infection and then look at patients with underlying hepatitis C or hepatitis B. But as you can appreciate, there was really no viral flare observed in either the HCV or HBV subgroup. And the rest of the safety profiles were actually very favorable, particularly for grade three and above events that were actually in the single digit range. So this is actually uh, overall you know, more favorable 
uh, compared with what you just heard you know, from the safety profiles for TKIs. But having said that, you know, this class of the agents you know, does have the immune-related adverse events that actually uh, warrants very close monitoring when patients receiving this class of agent. So with the encouraging data in the phase two setting, and particularly the durable responses that these patients experience uh, with nivolumab, I think the logical question is really trying to get a sense whether the agent will improve the overall survival in comparison uh, with a standard treatment, in this case, sorafenib. So the study was actually designed to address this question. Patient with advanced HCC, uh, not eligible for conventional treatment, preserve underlying hepatic function, treatment naive, uh, were randomized to receive either nivolumab or sorafenib, um, with a primary endpoint being overall survival. And this study uh, is really uh, one of the studies that we, the whole field you know, has been actually uh, really expecting for quite a long time. And the study finally got presented at this year's ASMO meeting. And as you can appreciate that the study has matured uh, with all the events uh, being shown. Uh, but unfortunately, the medium survival uh, was actually 14.7 months in the sorafenib arm versus 16.4 months for the nivolumab, with a hazard ratio of 0.85 and the p-value 0.07. And so this definitely uh, did not actually meet the statistical significance. If you examine the Koppelmeier curve, both for the overall survival as well as the progression-free survival on the right side, you do actually appreciate that the curve seemed to be actually separating towards the end of the tail of the curves. But having said that, you know, I think the study uh, should be considered as a negative study, statistically speaking. And also, I should emphasize the drug that definitely did not improve the progression-free survival. But consistent with Checkmate 040, the study recapitulate the response data that we have seen earlier. So it actually has 15% overall response rate for nivolumab and 7% in sorafenib. And the medium duration of this uh, response uh, was also uh, very respectful for the nivolumab arm at 20, uh, 23 months. So, uh, you know, clearly this was actually the first agent being examined in HCC. But then, you know, we have the second PD-1 antibody, pembrolizumab. Again, uh, initially this was examined in a cohort of patients of 104. Uh, with different underlying etiology. And in this study, uh, we recapitulate that this drug also produced 17% of the objective response rate, but more importantly, the response quality was also very good. These patients experienced durable responses. Uh, in this cohort, uh, the duration of response was actually not reached at the time of the analysis. So for this reason, uh, FDA also granted the accelerated approval for pembrolizumab based on this data. The safety profile was actually incredibly comparable to what we have seen for nivolumab. Again, single digit grade three and above events. The immune related AEs were actually uh, very rare and there was really no viral related flare in, uh, in the 224 uh, study. So the next critical study, a uh, pivotal study, uh, was really examining pembrolizumab in comparison with placebo in patients who actually failed the standard sorafenib treatment. So this was actually a very ambitious study looking at approximately 400 patients, two to one randomization, and patients will either receive the standard dose, pembro versus placebo, based on the Koppelmeier curve, uh, you definitely appreciate that the curve uh, separate very quickly, but then stay separate throughout the treatment course. And then, you know, the medium survival uh, was improved from 10.6 months in the placebo arm to 13.9 months in the treatment arm with Pembro, with a hazard ratio of 0.781 and a p-value of 0.023. So pembrolizumab reduced the risk of death uh, by 22% in this study. 
But on the other hand, this actually did not meet the pre-specified uh, threshold for statistical significance. Uh, it has to be actually reaching uh, 0 0.0174. And likewise, uh, the drug also improved the progression-free survival uh, you know, in this particular trial. So uh, with these two single agents showing uh, the very, very interesting response data, and obviously this has actually uh, has generated a lot of excitement. Uh, how do we actually combine this class of agents you know, with other drugs? I think the first approach that we have taken uh, is really to combine the PD-1 antibody or PD-L1 antibody with other checkpoint inhibitors, I think the mature data is only limited uh, with a combination of CTLA-4 blockade. So here you see uh, the cohort from 040 looking at nivolumab with ipilimumab combination. Uh, the investigators actually tested different dose schedule of ipilimumab, three milligram per kilo every three weeks, one milligram per kilo every three weeks, and also one milligram per kilo every six weeks. Without going through the details, uh, you can definitely appreciate that the double checkpoint blockade can actually produce response rate in the range of 30%. And also the duration of the response also very respectful at 17 months. Interestingly, for arm A, which is actually combining EP at a higher dose, three milligram per kilo, the medium survival for this cohort of the patient at 49 patients with very long follow-up, reaching 23 months. But I do have to caution that if, when you look at the grade three and above events, uh, you do actually have significant adverse events, particularly hepatitis uh, at 20% for arm A. Uh, nevertheless, uh, with this data, phase three study, looking at the comparison of nivolumab, ipilimumab versus sorafenib or levantinib is currently ongoing. And the next immune checkpoint inhibitor combined study is to combine Derva with tremolimumab, again, PDL1 in combination with CTLA4. And this was actually based on the early phase 1B study showing this combination produced uh, approximately 18% of the overall response rate. And for that reason, uh, this ambitious study, the so-called Himalaya study, was designed looking at the comparison of Derva alone versus Derva in combination with Tremi as two different dose <coughs> schedule versus the standard sorafenib arm. The results is eagerly awaited. So for the new directions for immunotherapy, uh, I think clearly we're exploring the dual inhibition with checkpoint inhibitors. We're also investigating this class of agents in the child PUB uh, status. And also, uh, I think, you know, very critically, uh, we're examining this class of agent in combination with either bevacizumab, anti-VEGF <coughs> antibody, or actually TKIs, including levantinib, cabozantinib, and apatinib. I'm going to highlight uh, two examples. So this is actually uh, a tizolizumab in combination with bevacizumab, PDL1 in combination with VEGF antibody. In the initial uh, study, uh, looking at a 73-patient cohort, you can actually appreciate that this regimen produced 32% uh, radiological responses, uh, so very impressive response rate. And also, these responses are actually uh, very durable. Uh, most of these patients uh, were able to enjoy uh, the radiological responses for a prolonged period of time. And the safety profile generally are actually manageable, even though in the early stage, uh, there were definitely a significant number of patients in experiencing uh, grade three and above events. But overall, the regimen was thought to be uh, manageable. And there were actually extended clinical experience with this combination, uh, both in terms of uh, in the randomized phase two setting, looking at atezolizumab versus atezolizumab, or continue to expand the cohort up to 104 patients. And you can definitely uh, appreciate that we have, you know, grade three and above events uh, are in approximately 40% range. But nevertheless, we're able to demonstrate this combination is better than a tezolizumab in a randomized phase two setting. 
And while these studies are ongoing, uh, the phase three trial were actually designed looking at this combination against the standard sorafenib uh, in a one-to-one -one ratio. And this was actually a sample size of 480 patients. This phase three trials probably set the record in terms of the uh, trial enrollment. Uh, the study was actually finished in enrollment uh, within approximately one year after the initiation of the trial. And then we just heard the uh, press release uh, in October. This study actually met uh, the co-primary endpoint demonstrating a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement both for OS as well as for PFS in comparison with sorafenib. And the detailed data we presented at ASMO Asia. Results showed that the hazard ratio for overall survival was 0 0.58. The median overall survival has not yet been reached for atezolizumab plus bevacizumab compared with 13.2 months for patients treated with sorafenib. The median progression-free survival significantly increased to 6.8 months with atezolizumab plus bevacizumab compared with 4.3 months with sorafenib. The hazard ratio was 0 0.59. Grades 3 to 4 adverse events occurred in 57% of patients treated with atezolizumab plus bevacizumab versus 55% of those who received sorafenib, and grade 5 adverse events occurred in 5% and 6% of patients, respectively. Also, compared with sorafenib, atezolizumab plus bevacizumab delayed deterioration in quality of life. So I think, you know, the results from this pivotal study will be actually paradigm shifting. And I think, you know, this will actually really changing how we manage patients with newly diagnosed advanced HCC. Another very interesting combination of levantinib with Pembro. Again, the clinical experience started from the initial phase 1-2 trial, looking at 30 patients, uh, showing radiological response rate at 40% based on the modified resist. The clinical experience uh, is actually uh, enriched up to 67 patients, uh, and this updated data was actually presented at ASMO. Again, even with the increasing number of patients, uh, we're still actually showing 45% response rate based on the modified resist. So again, you have another regimen uh, showing very impressive radiological responses. This is very different from when we first started the field, you know, with sorafenib showing, you know, response rate in the 2 to 3% range. So with this data, the phase 3 trial looking at the combination of levantinib pembro versus levantinib is currently ongoing. Uh, you know, the results are also eagerly awaited. And then we have another phase three trial looking at the combination of atezolizumab and cabozantinib versus the standard sorafenib. In this phase three trial, they do have a third arm of cabozantinib as a comparator. So I think in conclusion, uh, you know, I, even though you know, I'm not a hepatologist, uh, I do feel like you know, I enjoy obviously a lot of the wisdom from my colleagues in hepatology over the years. I think clearly when we manage patients, you know, with HCC, I think, you know, uh, the hepatologists have played a very critical role in terms of, you know, uh, really how to refer the patients uh, for the right treatment and also, you know, staying the course, uh, particularly in you know, helping us to manage the underlying hepatic dysfunction and also hepatitis management. And also, you know, really to guide us, you know, what would be the good treatment uh, decision at each time point. So I think, you know, clearly with these multidisciplinary efforts, I think the outcome for patients with HCC are definitely improving. I think there's a lot of interest, obviously, in this field, given all the progress and all the exciting data we're seeing, particularly with the combination therapies. I know you went over the data in terms of the patients with hepatitis B tolerating this. Um, can you clarify, so these patients were all on antiviral treatment for their hepatitis B? In your clinical practice, when patients are started on their antiviral treatment, is there a, a DNA cutoff or a time frame that you feel comfortable starting them on a checkpoint inhibitor, or is it the type of thing where as, um, you know, as long as they're on the antiviral treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, when we first started, you know, with the field, uh, all the patients with underlying hepatitis B should be actually uh, receiving antiviral therapy, and also the viral load should be below 100 international units. 
we're getting a little bit more generous. Right now, you know, the consensus is that, you know, we can probably tolerate up to 500 international units. But I think the key message is that, you know, for patients with HPV, they have to actually have adequate uh, viral control before going on with these treatments. They should actually continue on the antiviral treatment. For hepatitis C, though, uh, we're not routinely initiating the hepatitis C treatment. Uh, we're really based on whether the hepatic function is actually compensating. Uh, I think if a patient has an adequate hepatic function, you know, we don't necessarily treat the hepatitis C, but we will follow them while they're receiving the checkpoint inhibitor. And then, uh, Andrew, another question came up in terms of, you know, autoimmune hepatitis being a, a relative, um, you know, contraindication to using checkpoint inhibitors. And yeah. what other populations do you consider that checkpoint inhibitors should not be used in? So um, this is actually, obviously, you know, another very critical question. Uh, so I do think that this is actually highly variable depending on the severity of the autoimmune disease that you're seeing. Uh, I think the autoimmune hepatitis is clearly something that, you know, I will be incredibly cautious. Uh, but also, you know, there are other entities, for example, patients with autoimmune colitis, uh, you know, with Crohn's, uh, if they have actually not well-controlled Crohn's, I'll be very cautious before proceeding with this class of agents. Yeah, and I think another patient population that's really worth pointing out is anyone who's post-transplant. And so there's been really data that shows that um, if checkpoint inhibitors are used in a post-transplant patient, this is associated with high rates of graft loss and even death. And so at least the, the case series that I've seen shows a 50% chance of graft loss, about a 20 to 25% chance of death. Um, and so this patient population is really important to, to really be careful with. Um, and then likewise, if somebody's pre-transplant, I think we really don't know when it's potentially safe. And so I think that really is probably a good segue, um, Laura, into some of the stuff that you'll be discussing in terms of how this impacts the impact of local regional therapy and some of the advances we're probably gonna see. Uh, Dr. Kulik will be talking to us. She's a professor of medicine at Northwestern. Um, she's uh, clearly been leading the, the liver cancer program there for many years and uh, really excited to have her here. She's maximizing, uh, uh, she'll be talking about maximizing benefit for every patient with HCC, the enhancement of care using a multidisciplinary approach. Thank you, Amit. So we've seen this uh, slide, this is the BCLC, and I like to use this with my patients because it pairs it with a recommended therapy based on as much as possible randomized controlled trial, and we are seeing that the uh, advanced uh, patients, we are seeing a lot of randomized controlled trials to guide this. And I also like it because it gives us an estimated time of overall survival. So when you see a patient based on each uh, staging, uh, you can sit down and talk with them about what their anticipated survival would be. So this is looking at BCLC-B patients, and this really highlights that there are many different flavors. This is a very heterogeneous group of patients. Uh, there are some patients that you may consider downstaging. There are other patients that are beyond downstaging. There are patients beyond the ability to treat with local regional therapy, and these are patients that we would start systemic therapy as first-line therapy as opposed to local regional therapy. Um, and these are some of the issues that we will discuss today. So this is from the WSLD guidance. There are guidelines as well as guidance. I would encourage you to read uh, both documents. And it shows that for patients with intermediate stage disease, which I think is a stage that really is going to be affected a lot by some of these new therapies that we have heard about, um, that chemoembolization is the uh, treatment of choice with level evidence of one. And then there is also some evidence, uh, which is level evidence two, looking at radioembolization. So according to uh, the WSLD guidelines and patients who are not candidates uh, for a surgical option, um, so they are not resection or transplant candidates and they're uh, Milan or beyond the Milan criteria, uh, what is the, uh, would you treat them with local regional therapy? And the WSLD does feel that you should treat them with local regional therapy. Again, chemoembolization um, has been shown in randomized controlled trials to have the best evidence for this. Uh, the use of radioembolization and SBRT is still evolving, but it is uh, a consideration. And the WSLD does not consider one form of local regional therapy over the other, and I think this is um, a smart recommendation because you will find that there is a level of experience that is dependent upon each institution. 
So in terms of chemoembolization, um, there were two randomized controlled trials that showed that this improved overall survival and intermediate HCC compared doing no therapy. And then after that, patients were receiving chemoembolization uh, for intermediate disease. And, and I think this study, which is very recent, very nicely points out that these are patients, if you, if you select according to the stringent criteria to what you do in randomized controlled trials, that the most optimal patient for chemoembolization is one who has preserved liver function, prefer, preserved ECOG, no evidence of vascular invasion or metastatic disease, and no evidence of decompensation related to their underlying liver disease. Patients who have had SBP or ascites or esophageal varicy band, uh, uh, bleeding are not going to do well with chemoembolization. And this study specifically picked patients who fit this criteria, and they came up with a uh, what's called t uh, 6 and 12 prognostic score. And this is a linear predictor looking at the size of the largest lesion <laughs> plus the number of lesions. And in patients who have uh, lesser up to six, you can see that median overall survival is excellent at 49, per, uh, 49 months. However, as you increase tuber burden and greater than 12, this decreases to 15.8 months. So really highlighting that selecting the most appropriate candidates for this therapy will lead to uh, improvement in overall survival. There has been uh, movement in terms of SBRT. Um, there has been retrospective trials that have looked at this compared to ke uh, chemoembolization and has found that there is improvement in local tumor uh, control. However, there's no difference in overall survival. There have been meta-analysis that have looked at the combination of chemoembolization plus external beam radiation and have found that this leads to improvement in overall survival compared to patients treated with monotherapy TACE. And there are ongoing trials looking at patients who have received chemoembolization who did not show a complete response based on imaging who will be randomized to SBRT versus receiving concomitant chemoembolization. So I will uh, again go to the BCLC staging system, and we know that patients in natural history, if you cannot cure them, that most of these patients are going to have stage migration, and then we'll be talking about advanced disease and some of the therapies that we have heard about. However, I will submit to you that there are patients who, with local regional therapy, that we can transition these patients from an intermediate stage to a early stage where we can potentially perform uh, a curative option. So we all know that transplantation offers the best chance for long-term cure. This is due to the fact that we remove the cancer as well as the underlying cirrhotic liver, which can kill the patient from complications. But there are patients who are beyond what were called the Milan criteria, which are used as our selection criteria in the United States since 1996 for transplantation. However, there are patients that we see that you can downstage and will achieve the best um, improvement from transplant, even more so than patients with earlier disease, and we'll talk a little bit about this. So from both WSLD as well as EZL, there has been support that in patients who are carefully selected for downstaging, who are downstaged to meet the Milan criteria, the transplantation should be a consideration in such patients. So downstaging, the premise of this has really been the use of local regional therapy to biologically stage patients with tumor beyond their tumor size and number. And there are multiple factors that are um, seen in this. I won't go through all of these, but the goal is really to get patients to a curative option, which would be transplant or resection. And this kind of goes nicely with a recent change in the governing body of transplantation, and a lot of this was uh, as a result of Francis Yao and UCSF, who has driven uh, the data for downstaging. And OPTN has recognized that in patients who are successfully downstaged, that such patients can have a very uh, uh, good overall survival with transplantation. And there has to be a ceiling for tumors. So this is where you can start from. So if you have a patient with a 20 centimeter tumor, this is not someone that you're going to try to downstage. And if they are successfully downstaged based on the enhancement of the tumor within the Milan criteria, they can now receive a standard MELD exception for HCC, which no longer has to go through a voting process in order to receive points as an exception for transplantation. Um, so we have, you know, the exception points is, is really to get patients to transplantation is the goal with downstaging. However, there have been many different um, 
uh, areas that have looked at beyond Milan, can you transplant patients such as UCSF, there's Asian criteria. I think the, the more commonly one that is talked about is called the Metro Ticket. Um, this was done by Dr. Amazzo Ferro, and very recently they um, added the AFP to this, and what you can see is the higher the tumor burden, this is a uh, but, uh, a combination of tumor size and number, so up to seven, so you can have a single lesion up to six centimeters to give you a summation of seven. And as the tumor burden decreases in terms of tumor size and number, there is an increase in AFP that can be allowed. And they modeled this to look specifically at HCC-related death uh, post-transplant. And you can calculate this using a calculator looking at tumor size, number, and AFP that will give you a five-year overall survival post-transplant. So we know there are patients who meet the Milan criteria who have very high AFP. When you look at all the transplant data, the one thing that has borne out time and time again in these, uh, these multivariate analysis in terms of overall survival is what the AFP was closer to the time of transplant. And in patients who have an AFP exceeding 1,000, they have a very dismal prognosis. Up to 50% of these patients will have HCC recurrence, and the most common cause of death in such patients is their cancer. And based on this, uh, the OPTN has if made changes to uh, eligibility for transplantation. So even if they meet tumor size and number, if you have a lesion that is two centimeters, but they have an AFP greater than 1,000 at the time of listing, they will not receive a standard MELD upgrade. However, if they are successfully downstaged by AFP with local regional therapy and their AFP is driven down to 500, then such patients can be applied for a standard MELD exception. So this is a patient of mine. This is several years ago. I get a, um, um, a card and flowers every year from this patient. Um, he had a 9-centimeter, 4-centimeter tumor uh, with HCC. Baseline AFP was uh, approaching 2,000. I show one of the lesions here. This patient underwent radioembolization. We had a robust discussion. This was before the AFP, um, the number of greater than 1,000, came into play. Um, should we continue to try to drive this AFP down further to normalization? It was decided to treat this patient further. Uh, AFP did continue to de decrease after the second radioembolization. We waited a total of nine months. This patient was then found to have a living donor, and we pre proceeded with transplantation using a living donor on explant. Uh, this patient met the Milan criteria. There was no vascular invasion, and this patient is now actually eight years post-transplant and has had no evidence of recurrence. So using both the AFP decline as well as the radiographic response to determine that this patient would be a transplant my candidate. Now, looking at hepatic resection, there are many criteria. I want to focus uh, more on the future liver remnant. In patients who have underlying cirrhosis, you need to have at least a 40% of your liver that will remain after resection in order to um, avoid going into uh, liver failure. So there are some patients who meet the criteria in terms of not having significant portal hypertension, but based on the strategic location of that tumor, you have to do an extended hepatectomy or a right lobe, and that patient may not have enough liver based on their future liver remnant. And, and kind of by happenstance, it was found that when we were doing radioembolization, that we found that not only did this treat the tumor, but we were finding that there was hypertrophy of the opposite lobe. And so we have seen that patients start to just demonstrate this as soon as one month, and this will continue up to nine months. And this has now become what we will do in a patient who otherwise is a good resection candidate, but their FLR is not large enough. We'll treat the tumor and then wait and see if their uh, future liver remnant increases to greater than 40% to allow them resection. However, the problem is, is we still have underlying cirrhosis, which will lead to increased risk of recurrence. Um, and therefore, um, patients uh, will need to continue to be followed. And unfortunately, there has not been an adjuvant therapy that has been found to decrease recurrence. It will remain to be seen in such patients who have been treated um, with hepatitis C drugs. If they have had a resection, one would expect that their re uh, recurrence rate would decrease. Um, there was the STORM trial looking at serafinib. Unfortunately, this did not demonstrate a decrease in recurrence after resection or ablation. There are many trials that are ongoing. I will highlight some of these. Um, this is looking at nivolumab uh, versus placebo after resection in patients who have undergone high-risk uh, resection based on their explant. 
There is also uh, looking at adjuvant pembrolizumab uh, compared to placebo. And then lastly, there is a three-tier trial looking at Dura plus Bev versus Dura plus placebo uh, versus placebo. And if we can find a combination or therapy that decreases recurrence post-resection, uh, this would be well uh, welcomed. So now let's look at transitioning. When do we transition? I think this is a very important question, and, and I think this depends on a uh, case-by-case basis. Uh, but now that we have more and more drugs, this becomes much more relevant. We have seen in the resource trial that just in child through A, five versus six made a big difference in the subgroup analysis in terms of overall survival. So the longer you wait and you continue to treat patients with local regional therapy or they have progression of their tumor, there can be decompensation and there Therefore, they may not achieve as much of a benefit with the systemic therapy. So the other considerations are when is a patient considered taste refractory, and this has been debatable. Most people will agree that if you treat uh, the same lesion with two treatments and they still have viable disease, it should, you should move on to a second therapy, uh, specifically potentially systemic therapy. The pattern or progression really does matter. If this patient develops metastatic disease, you should be moving quickly to a systemic therapy. And as uh, Amit mentioned, is there consideration for transplantation? I think with uh, Lenvima, there has been some exciting data that has showed a response up to 41%. And there was just a, um, a poster that was presented in oral form uh, here at this meeting that looked at the use of Lenvima to decrease the tumor size followed by chemoembolization. And so a little bit of the opposite of what we see, chemoembolization followed by the initiation of systemic therapy. Um, so would this help to downstage a patient to a transplant or resection? And then the implications for immunotherapy are ones that as a transplant hepatologist, I think we really have to keep in mind um, because if patients do get a, um, uh, such as a checkpoint inhibitor, what will happen if they then go on to transplant and will this block them from a transplant? There's a lot of rationale for combining um, therapies with local, regional, and systemic. The thought is that local, regional therapies may show the tumor's kind of biology, show its antigens, so that immunotherapy may work uh, in a better, effective manner. Um, there are studies looking at SBRT in combination with uh, serafinib. Uh, this was one of the first studies, uh, the proof of concept, looking at real, local regional therapy uh, in combination with a CTL4 antibody. Um, and what they did is they did a sublethal treatment. So they did chemoembolization or RFA, and their goal wasn't to achieve a complete response, but their goal was to kind of release these antigens, and then they added the CTL4 antibody. And what interestingly what they found is they then biopsied these lesions. And in patients who were not even treated in that area, they they found an increase in um, immune cells within a area of tumor that would, did not undergo local regional therapy, suggesting this is scopal effect. We have seen this more with um, uh, uh, cancers such as melanoma. There are multiple ongoing trials that are looking and combining local regional therapy and immune therapies. We will not go over these. You will have these available to you. Some that I'll highlight are is the PETAL trial that is looking at pembrolizumab following uh, chemoembolization. This is ongoing. This is a single arm study. The uh, primary endpoint is looking at safety. And you can see uh, from this uh, analysis thus far that there, were, there was no synergistic toxicity that has been found. This is another trial uh, that is looking at taste plus immunotherapy uh, with several different arms looking at this combination. And again, as a, a transplant hepatologist, I just want to highlight that, you know, the, while this data is very encouraging with immunotherapy, I think that all patients deserve at least a cursory look that they should be seen by a transplant hepatologist and a surgeon to see if they would be a transplant candidate, either with downstaging. Um, there are many centers that are doing liver, um, uh, living donor transplantation where you don't have to necessarily meet the Milan criteria, but you want to show that they're a stable uh, tumor after local regional therapy. And and this is, highlights a, a case study where a patient, as Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Single was talking about, post-transplant. Um, and this patient was treated after uh, undergoing liver transplantation and died rapidly uh, due to uncontrolled um, rejection. And there has been limited data, uh, 29 cases of solid organ transplants, and their graft loss was 36% in patients who received a liver and 54% in patients who received a kidney transplant. 
Uh, there has been the ceramic trial, which was radioembolization uh, plus or minus uh, serafinib versus serafinib alone. Um, this was a negative trial. And you can see per protocol, there was a three-month benefit in terms of combination. I would argue this is clinically meaningful, however, statistically did not meet um, its endpoint. There were subgroups that they saw um, that did have more of a benefit and did meet um, a hazard ratio. However, there were increased side effects with this combination. So there are uh, a newer modality that is being looked at. These are tumor treatment fields. As this is taking advantage of the fact that um, patients who have cancer cells are going to divide differently than our normal cells. This is using electro fields uh, in order to uh, stop the mitosis in the cancer cells. Uh, here you see how this is done in a patient um, in the abdominal uh, cavity here. So there's an ongoing trial, single arm, looking at 25 patients. Uh, they will receive this treatment in combination with serafinib and undergo imaging every 12 weeks. Uh, this is a modality that is currently approved and the treatment of uh, glioblastoma and mesothelioma. So as a hepatologist, as uh, Ahmed had said, I think that these are our patients. We're the ones who generally are following them for a long period of time. And I think we need to maintain a very important role in managing these patients, despite the fact that um, there has been a development in these IV formulations. And uh, we often have a long-term relationship with them. The patient and the family often want to hear from us that they are that the option such as transplant is not uh, feasible. I don't think it's fair to send someone to an oncologist and have the oncologist who's not had a long-term relationship be the one who tells them. There are complications of portal hypertension uh, that we are best managed to, to handle. We need to make decisions in terms of should we treat their hepatitis C. And it's important that when we first see these patients, and I know that I do myself, I start discussing with them that the the future is that they will eventually go on a systemic agent, and I think it helps them digest this a lot better. I finally want to end with the fact that we, we do all need to work together. There has been data shown in this cancer as well as others that the more we work together, the better the benefit for the patient. And so working together improves overall survival. And I will hand it off to Dr. Singel. Yeah, I don't think I could have said it any better than Dr. Kulig on the last couple slides in, this, in the sense that really this is a team effort. But as you've heard, I mean, hepatologists have continued to be a central um, piece of this multidisciplinary team. And I think that it's, um, it's important that we continue to do several of the jobs that Dr. Kulik pointed out. As we've seen an expansion um, in the uh, checkpoint inhibitors and particularly the combination therapies that we've heard about, um, I think that it's going to become uh, easy, perhaps, in terms of us not being so involved in the patients. But I would really caution us not to allow that to happen and that we really need to continue playing a central role, continuing to work with our medical oncology colleagues. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we're having you know, this, this program here is to make sure that all of us remain educated about all of the exciting advances that we're going to see over the next several years. Um, I, I think that one of the questions um, that um, is here that I think it's worth discussing um, is, um, Laura, I'll, I'll let you have this one, is like, what's the best time to start systemic therapy after local regional therapy? Um, you know, we talked about the appropriate time to transition, but what is that? Like, how do you define that in your clinical practice? So I think that's, um, you know, a patient who is showing rapid progression, um, looking at the number of treatments that they've had. Um, we have tip we've had a lot of trials that have looked at combination of serafinib with chemoembolization, and unfortunately those have all been negative um, with the uh, oral abstract that was presented today, it's, I think it's very provoking and very uh, changing in, in what may happen in, in giving something like glenvatinib up front and then followed by chemoembolization. Uh, I don't think we're at that point now. Um, but I think patients who are progressing rapidly, um, depending on the number of therapies that they've had, if they have bilobar disease, even if it's not advanced disease, um, I think preserving their liver function and knowing that we're not going to be able to treat all that tumor uh, without potentially harming their liver function. Um, the last question, and of course it's uh, going to go out with an explosion, is, is um, tear. So radioembolization, portal vein invasion, do you think now with the field moving with combination therapies, 
radio embolization, does it play less of a role with limited portal vein invasion, or do you think it still has a role in some of those patients? I'll say I'm glad there's one person <laughs> between me and Joseph. Um, so there have been three negative trials that have been negative. Sorry, I think it's a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there were a lot of flaws in those trials, but having said that, they are negative. Um, we, uh, I think, looking at centers such as uh, Northwestern that ha we have been fortunate enough to have uh, leaders in the field like Dr. Salem and Dr. Lewandowski uh, who know which patients to treat and which ones not to treat um, is very crucial and that th those types of uh, patients and that decision making I don't think was in the randomized control trials that were negative. We now have a uh, way to discriminate what patients are going to be best treated with radioembolization. It should not be main portal vein invasion. It should not be people with bulky tumors greater than 50%, people with bilirubins that are high. Um, we at Northwestern have had patients that we have successfully downstaged to transplantation. Now those numbers are small and we would expect they will continue to be small. But in patients who are otherwise good candidates based on uh, the, the, the thing that Dr. Bonsofero had uh, recently published, the overall survival in a patient with good prognostic factors is 38 months in a patient with a portal vein invasion without metastatic disease. So I do think that there is room to uh, further refine this. Do I think that companies are going to spend the money to look at this? I think no, because this field is moving so quick. So I think the places where they do this really well and they have a lot of expertise, it will continue to be a potential uh, therapeutic option. Great. Um, I think that was a great way to end. I think that, uh, once again, I think we've had a lot of good discussion. Um, really, um, it's, it's an exciting time in HEC. If nothing else, we've seen progress tremendously in this space, an explosion of therapies. Uh, sometimes it's almost amazing. Every time we see one of these programs, it's almost like a new therapy is either announced or a new agent has been approved, and so this is a quickly moving field. Um, and I want to thank everyone here for, for spending uh, their evening with us. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash GWD860. This educational activity is supported by independent medical education grants from ASI Incorporated, Exelixis Incorporated, Genentech, Lilly, Merck and Company Incorporated, and Novocure. For further information concerning Lilly Grant funding, visit www.lillygrantoffice.com.